Welcome to the Catfish and Crappie Podcast. My name is Mark, and today's special guest is Dave Weiner. What's going on, Dave? How are you, sir? It's a good day. How are, how are you doing? It's a great day. Um, I had heard a podcast uh, uh, that Spencer had on the River Certified Podcast, and and uh, um, here's a little side note. I will listen to podcasts every night uh, before I go to bed. Uh, it, it, not that they're bad or anything, but it's, it's better than listening to myself. Uh, and it gets me to be able to sleep, but I'll tell you what the podcast I listened to, uh, with you and Spencer kept me up for the whole time. I think it was like an hour and a half or something. Or there was no going to sleep after that. I was so interested and I'm like, I have to get Dave on the show. So here we are, Dave. I want to thank you for taking the time to be here and, and sharing some of your story and your knowledge with us. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you liked it, and hopefully um, the people listening to this will like it as much as you liked the previous. I, I, I don't doubt that uh, one bit whatsoever. So let's start uh, uh, with an introduction. Why don't you tell us uh, a little about yourself, um, um, what you do, where you're from, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, my name is Dave Weiner. I own Chasing Cats Guide Service. It's in central Iowa, Des Moines area, which if you're not familiar with, Iowa is the center of the state. It's the best way of putting it. Um, 43 years old, and I've been fishing probably 39 of those years. Um, most all of it's been in Iowa, with the exception of a Minnesota trip, and I fished Lake of the Ozarks once. And otherwise, I, I stay in my state and, and try to make the best of, of what's around me. Um, that's kind of what I do in the, in the, the summer months and switch over to ice fishing and hunting in the fall yeah i you know i know a lot of people that travel to fish i'm i'm kind of like you i consider myself well not a home body but a home waters body i think uh, if you spend more time fishing the waters that are close available and accessible to you easily that you're gonna it's going to be easy well you're going to get better at mastering those waters and, and learning your craft do you think that's that's the way to do it or yeah i do um i can tell you where one of the lakes we fish is roughly 5,000 acres. And I can tell you without a sonar where every rock pile is, where every brush pile is, where every ledge starts, where the channel bends. Um, but, you know, that's the home waters. And yep. That, that, that being said, there's traveling is awesome. And I can't recommend enough. I know I've traveled to fish a bunch of times. I've traveled to fish where I've been on strange waters and have done terrible. But then what I've started doing was hiring a guide the first day or two, however long I'm there. And I will actually talk to the guy and say, hey, listen, I'm going to be here all week. I need a head start. Are you willing to uh, walk me through uh, and inter make it so it's my fishing is better for the week I'm here? And then I go home back to northern Illinois and not come back here for a long time. And most of the guys that I've talked to are always willing to do that. So um, I can't recommend you, you you do that when you're traveling, unless you're visiting friends, of course. And hopefully they better be on the fish, because if they're not, I'm coming after them <laughs> through social media. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that makes total sense. Do you do you come into well, you are a guide in, in Iowa. Do you do you come across people like me often, or do people just hire you and expect to go catch a so, bunch of fish? I would say probably 90% of the people that I take out are not from Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, and I think a little bit later on we're gonna talk about kind of how I run things and why it's different than um hundred percent of the other guides that are out there. Cool. But I have taken people from Canada, China, Thailand, Mexico, and almost every state in the U.S. Um, last year, did about 98 trips or 98 people through the boat. This year, it's going to be about 83, but I turfed a lot of those um, above and beyond that to my other guide. And uh, I bet you seven or eight of those were from Iowa and the majority were from out of state. From out of state. Cool. Well, let, 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 let's take a step back. Let, let's talk a little bit about your history for, in fishing. Um, where do your fishing roots come from? What are some of your earliest memories? How, how did you get involved in, in the life? Well, I call it a lifestyle or a passion or, 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 or a habit sometimes and an addiction even. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? <clears throat> Um, if you've heard any of the presentations or seminars that I've done, you've heard the story. And if you, if you haven't, and for the new people that, that are tuning in, um, 
I can't tell you what I did a week ago, but I can tell you the first fish I ever caught. And I can tell you the first boat that I ever fell in love with. So I'm going to start with those two things. Perfect. Um, I would say I was probably four or five years old. And my uncle was an outdoorsman. My dad was an outdoorsman. My dad didn't really fish much, but he was in the hunting. My uncle, um, he was truly like a live off the land, off the grid type of a guy. And he took me uh, fishing for the first time. So we were in an old, uh, an old like Coleman um, canoe. And he gave me a green fiberglass rod with a, uh, you know, just the push button, like Zebco 33 on there, and the red and white bobber. And I remember him kept telling me, quit moving, quit moving. You're going to tip over <laughs> the canoe. So I remember all the details of this. Like I said, I can't remember what I did a week ago. But um, when we get out to where we're going, we drop an anchor, and we're sitting there. And I'm, I go, what do we do now? Well, we just sit and wait. And he's telling me, you know, listen to the birds. Aren't they, aren't they neat? There's a deer. Um, and watch your bobber. When the bobber starts, he called it dancing. When your bobber starts dancing, let me know. We'll, we'll go from there. So I'm sitting there, and uh, the bobber starts going up and down, and I get all excited. Okay, now you just have to wait. You just have to wait. And then when the bobber went under, you know, he kind of coached me through it. So that was the first fish I caught. But the ironic thing is, is it was a channel cat. Um, and so... People ask me all the time, well, what do you, what's your personal best? And what's this and that? I can't remember three fish I catch all year or last year or the last 10 years, but I can remember the first fish I caught. So, and it since that's kind of my best trophy was the, the one that stuck with me for basically, you know, 35, 40 years. Absolutely. And stories like that stick. I've, I've similar stories of fishing with my grandfather. My father was not an outdoorsman whatsoever, but my grandfather came over here uh, overseas a long, long, long time ago. And, and uh, he was handicapped. He was a one legged sailor, literally had a, a wooden leg, not a peg leg, but a wooden leg. And uh, he used to babysit me. So we either ended up at the corner tavern with him or fishing. My mother would much rather he took me fishing. So we did a lot of fishing here. So I totally get the, how fun those memories are and how they stick out. I mean, I couldn't tell you what I caught last, you know, same thing last couple of weeks, let alone, but I can tell you the first, I can tell you, probably remember most of my trips with him always because he was getting in trouble and we got back, but that's another story. So <laughs> now let's talk a little bit about that first boat. You said you were really fond of. Yeah. So uh, we lived in an apartment building in about the same age. And the manager of the apartment building had a bass boat. And like many of the bass boats now, you know, they're all full of glitter and shine. And so this one was red and silver. And I, I want to say it was a ranger, but I can't remember, you know, the details. <clears throat> but he would go out and he fished all the time, like every, every day that he could. And then he'd come home and clean the boat. And I would go out and hang out with him. And I was mesmerized by that boat and how in the sun it just was capturing, you know, the, all the sparkles and stuff. And I would just sit and look at that and, and I'd move my head to this angle to move my head to that angle. And, you know, he'd say, well, here's a rubber worm that I, I fished with today. It's got a tear in it or whatever. Why don't you have it? So I ended up with this collection of plastic baits and, you know, rubber baits. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. But again, you know, I can, I can remember that as vividly as if it happened 10 minutes ago but I couldn't tell you three things from high school or you know, anything like that. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So that that's the first, well, it, did you end up buying that boat or, or do you just remember that as your earliest no, experience? That with was boater? my first, uh, that was just my first memory of like falling in love with a boat. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't own it or I've never owned a fiberglass boat. It's on the list of things I like though. Yeah. I'm, I'm an aluminum guy myself, but if someone gave me an, a, uh, a fiberglass bass boat. So I'd take it. I could probably put some crappie on the deck of one of those pretty easy, but uh, we're going to stick with my nice deeper uh, <laughs> aluminum boats. Um, sure. So um, what, what are you doing now? If you don't mind sharing with outside of guiding, can you let us know a little bit about what, what your life and, and business is like maybe? Yeah. Um, Cause I've you do always... work, you do work full time. We talked a little bit besides guiding. So guiding, you do guiding a lot, but that's not your full-time job, is it? I would say if you look at hours per week, 
Mm, um, okay. I spend more time guiding in the summertime than I do working um, my consistent job, if you will, my 12-month mm -hmm. a year job. So I work uh, part-time, actually. It's, a, it's called a permanent part-time position. It's a benefited position with 24 hours a week at the local fire station. And my current role is a, is a fire inspector and public education um, specialist. And I do uh, the, the PIO, which is public information officer. Um, for the station too. So things like Facebook and, mm -hmm. um, you know, media stuff as, as needed. If everybody else like, wears the white shirts or shiny gold badges are busy, then I guess it falls to me. But um, in the summertime, I'm, I'm two days at the fire station and I'm every day, I'll, I'll, every available day I'm, I'm guiding and, one trip, two trips, whatever the case is, I, I just can't keep up, which is why I brought another guide on this year. So it's, a little, I'm sorry, a little bit more on that is I've been in that role for about seven years. Um, prior to that, I spent 10 years as a, uh, as a firefighter paramedic. And then I spent four or five years um, as an EMT and firefighter. Well, thank you for doing all that. Those jobs are pretty important to mm -hmm. all of us regular people out here. So thank you. I'm going to say thank you for everybody watching this too. It's always good to have, you know, heroes like you who are out there, you know, helping and, and saving people, literally saving lives um, uh, rather than what the people who get the attention these days are. But that's that's a totally different story. So every time I hear somebody who actually does a good job, it, it it makes me just want to say thanks. So I appreciate it. And you, you had also mentioned to me that you also uh, um, have done some dog training. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Because I was really fascinated about when we were to, uh, about you telling me about it. Sure. Um, kind of a little backstory be before I go into that detail. My mm -hmm. wife has, has a job for almost 20 years where she travels um, until last year with COVID. But she traveled quite a bit and she'd be gone anywhere from a week to uh I think a month was like the longest she'd been gone. So my daughter's 16. Um, when she was younger, it made more sense for one of us to stay home um, versus paying daycare. Or if you have a sick kid trying to use your sick time and <clears throat> it just worked better. So I ended up working nights at the fire station, staying home with her during the day. So I haven't worked a, a full-time job in 16 years but I've always worked at least two jobs. So it's always been the fire department plus something else. Um, we had an Iowa, Iowa made store, had my dog kennel and I'll, I'll circle back to that in just a second. Had a photography business and now I have the guide business. But um, people who know me um, know that if it's not 100% perfect, then I'm not so whatever I said, I'm trying to say this, I do believe like you need to be as humble as possible. So I, I lay that as a foundation. But what, what really is my driving motivation is perfection. Um, so when I started this dog kennel, it was a dog kennel that was registered in Germany and it was uh, a German kennel that was registered in the United States. I set myself up with one goal. I was going to have the, the best dog in the world. <clears throat> and that's I not a, of, that's not an easy goal to achieve. That's pretty, <laughs> yeah. that's really setting the marks kind of high for yourself, but go on. Um, so I trained several dogs. We shipped dogs over to Germany. They would ship dogs back over here. And in 2006, I had a female that was the youngest dog. She was 18 months old. It was the youngest dog in, in German history to win the world trials over there. So I met that goal and she carried that title for two years. Um, <clears throat> and so I was one of those things I wasn't going to rest in a sense, like a pit bull once you bite, bite in. And that's like, that's my goal. That's what drives me. And I'm not going to stop. And I will, at, no matter what the cost is, meet, meet the goal that I set. Now, what kind of, what kind of dogs were they? They were German short hairs. So they short were bird dogs or 
they were versatile dogs, so they they were trained and tested in things like blood tracking, fox hunting, um, rabbit hunting, pheasant hunting, duck hunting, and then just general um, like mental stability. There was tests that they would do with mental stability. You lay your dog down in the field, you walk away for 10 or 15 minutes or go have lunch where the dog can't see you and the dog has to stay there. It can't bark, it can't, excuse me, it can't whine, it can't get up and and run around. So it, it all aspects. And then there was the confirmation side of things. Um, the Germans are, are very particular with their breeding program. And so if your dog didn't pass X, Y, and Z test, along with how the dog was built if the bite was off if the eyes were off the skin was was not right the coat wasn't right the height wasn't right the movement um it was an inbreedable dog so trying to put all those pieces together is hard enough but then when you're trying to test on on those levels um it's even harder it Cool. <laughs> I wish I knew more about it. We'd have more conversation about it. Let's sure. get let's get back let's get back to your guiding. So, um, you had explained that um, you you'd always had at least two jobs and stuff. Is that how you led to guiding? You chose one of those jobs to be guiding. Is that how you got there? Uh, yeah. You know, I talked to um, Matt Davis, who kind of got me more into and the trolling and drifting side of of catfishing. And he's the owner of Whisker Seeker, which is one of the companies that I fish for. And I, I fished with him quite a bit. And he kept saying, you know, why don't you, why don't you just start guiding? I mean, you've got the personality for it. Um, you get, you got the equipment that's good. And there's a market to be had. So that's kind of where I got into that was, uh, Oh, I don't want to say I got pushed off the cliff, but I got pushed to the edge of the cliff, and I guess we jumped again. I, I can relate. That's how I got into doing this, to be honest with you. But we can talk about that after the fact. I kind of got pushed into this, too, so I understand exactly what you're talking about. Uh, so what, what was guiding like in the beginning? Uh, it was a lot of – I'm always good with – I'm good with people, and I'm, I'm good with I'm trying to get my point across – to anybody's level and i think that's why and you know with the fire department stuff and the public education i can talk to preschool kids or i can talk to seniors um, and i can try to come up with analogies and different scenarios that work for that particular person so it just it just was one of those things that um all the pieces came together and it, it worked out and the the more that i did it the more i understood like okay people don't want to know about this they want to know about this or um you know don't talk don't talk over somebody you need to listen to what they're trying to say so that, that was really the the first year was just trying to get the feel for what's what's the average baseline going to be and then how do you address the average baseline? But with that too, you know, you have to come up with some type of a business plan. So when you talk about guiding, it's not just, hey, you, you and I are gonna go out on the water and we're gonna fish. It's what are my expenses? You know, how am I going to get the name out there? So that to me was more of the challenge the first year or two of it versus getting the people on the water and fishing with them and, and teaching them the information that they needed to know to make that trip successful. You can't get people in your boat if you don't know how to get them to you. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, did I answer that question well enough for you? Because you, ab you, absolutely, you absolutely did. Uh, now, how long have you been guiding for? So I'm wrapping up the fifth year. Fifth year. So you got any good guiding stories without naming any client names or anything? Um, yeah. And again, people have heard this uh, before if they've listened to seminars or podcasts, but I have two that I'll share with you that I really appreciate. And, and they, they, they do stick with me the most. <clears throat> I had a guy that got a hold of me. He's an older gentleman. 
Um, and he doesn't have, I, I don't really don't know how he got my information. If I saw it on a flyer somewhere or somebody handed him a card, I have no idea. But he called me and he said that he wanted to go on a trip. And um, I told him like, hey, I need to have a you know hundred dollar deposit. I need an email with what your expectations are, what you want to do, what do we want to cover? Because I don't have a computer, I don't have um, email. I have a flip phone, and I have a checkbook, or I can you know drop cash off to you. So I'm thinking, you know, hey, if this guy's old school enough, then his words is word. I'll just meet him at the dock at a certain day at a certain time. So we get together and we start fishing and I go through like my normal because he just said, I just kind of want to go out and fish and, and just have a nice day on the boat. Okay. So we get started and it was, it was colder than jacket weather. And we're right off the bat. We're on fish, we're on fish and they're okay fish, you know, average to maybe a little bit larger than average. And he hooks into this gigantic channel cap. And I can tell like right off the bat that it's a good fish. You know, when that, when the rod doesn't bounce around and it's just dead weight down there mm -hmm. and you're fishing in 25 feet of water and there's no head shakes, there's no rolling. It's just like you hooked into the, like a snag, just a log. So I'm kind of coached him through it. And then the, that fish starts fighting a little bit. And this guy's, you know, he's an older guy and he starts laughing like a, like a young school girl and he's just having a ball fight and so you know okay you're you're reeling a little too quick you know you just let the fish fight the rod and just coach him through it so we get the fish in the boat and i've never seen eyes get as big as this guy's eyes and get about that fish on some grippers and we start taking pictures of it and we release the fish and the first thing he tells me is, I want to go back to the dock. I'm, I'm done fishing. And we're maybe only like an hour, hour and a half into our trip. I, what's the matter, man? Are, you know, something's Something not, wrong? <laughs> yeah, what's, what's going on? Like, we're 15 fish in, and you just caught a giant. Um, let's just keep rolling. I mean, everything's in our favor, and, and we're on fire. Now, I, I, want, to go, I want to go home. And so I, I brought him a little bit more on this. And I don't want to bore people with a long story, but the the end result was he didn't have a way to text a picture. He didn't have a way to send an email, um, but he wanted to go home while that, while that event was fresh in his mind. And the, he wanted to tell his wife. That's, that's what he wanted to do is he wanted to go home while he was still excited and still pumped up about it and tell her everything about it. So I actually... Um, I took some pictures of it. I edited them, edit, edited them enough to like change the lighting so it was good, mm -hmm. and, you know, crop out some stuff. And I printed off a few of those and delivered them to him so he'd have a. a I'm message. sure he was real grateful. I'm sure his wife was excited to hear the story too. I know when yeah. I tell my wife, you know, my wife doesn't mind me telling her my fish stories. It's me telling her my skunk stories that she doesn't like too much. That seems to be a problem. She says I'm awfully crabby when I come home without a fish, but. Hopefully that won't happen too much often. Here, that's an awesome story. Well, it's good. It's good that you had somebody on there that's that excited and that I, I'll get that way about certain fish and that. But maybe I ought to try just packing it in for the day afterwards because it does kind of wear off during the day. Maybe he was onto something. Yeah, I don't know. I hate I hate when we catch a, a giant the first one or two. You know, because yeah, then the rest of the day is a little slow. <clears throat> right, or it's, you know, I, I tell him, hey, you caught a trophy fish. You know, I don't know if we're gonna do. How the rest of the day is going to go, but let's do it again. Too hot. Yeah. yeah it's, let's do it again is what they're thinking, right? It doesn't always right. happen that way. I've had experiences like that too. You get that, that 40 pound flathead like 20 minutes into your trip. What do you do the rest of the eight hours you're out there? It does make for a long day. I'm pretty, right. I'm pretty happy about it, but I'd rather catch it at the end of the day than at the beginning if I'm catching it at all. So I kind of get that. Can um, I share one more story with you? Absolutely. Okay, so I, I, I got a phone call uh, three years ago from a guy, and he said, hey, I see you out fishing. He goes, I don't understand. And he says, you guys catch way more fish than I do, but I see you on the water all the time. Uh, so something's, you're doing something different. Uh, what's your program? I said, well, you, what you need to do is you need to book a trip with me. Come out, we'll go through it all. But I, I, 
I kind of really don't have the time to explain five hours on the phone of, of what makes it work and what doesn't. Well, and he says, okay, how old are you? So I tell him how old I am. I've been fishing. He said, actually, he said, son, I've been fishing longer than you've been alive. I said, well, you called me. So apparently yeah, I was going to say he's calling wrong, you, though, right? You know? <laughs> and uh, I said, if you book the trip, if you if you walk away unsatisfied, I'll, I'll give you your money back. But we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make a good, a good educational trip out of this for you. So I... I explained like what I do at the start of every trip, you know, here's what we're looking for and, and here's what you do when this happens and here's what you do when that happens. And so the rod loads up and bends over and he goes over and he swoops that rod out of the rod holder hundred miles an hour. Now you got to reel down. So he goes to reel down on the next one, but it's like a bull in a china shop and then in the rod tips just whipping like crazy. Well, every, it's like every six inches of rod movements, three feet of slack line. So, you know, that fish doesn't get hooked. It comes off. I said, you're not listening to what I'm telling you. You know, when the rod loads up, you have to put one hand up here and then just start reeling. And, and there's a way to reel so that you don't have a lot of rod width in it. And he did it wrong one more time. And I said, okay, the next time that rod loads up, don't touch it. I'm going to come over there with, with my hand. I'm going to put your left hand on the, the fighting part of that, that handle. I'm going to take my other hand and I'm going to put it on the reel. And we're going to reel this down together because if you don't get the hook set right, the whole rest of the, you, you don't have a fish to fight. So I can't, I can't walk you through the rest of it. So we did that. Did the next one, did the next one. And it, it was like that light bulb moment. So what he was doing was he was fishing the right areas. He's fishing good bait. He was, his presentation was good, but it, it was the, um, the fundamentals of getting that fish on the rod at the right time and working it through the boat that was his issue. So after we went through that, you could see, and I, I, I see the guy all the time and I talk to him at least probably once a week or, or more. And, He's super grateful that that changed his, his success in catfish, which is it's pro definitely. I mean, it, even using circle hooks, it take it, it, that those little nuances really do make a difference. You know, make sure you reel. I, I always have to tell myself where I did for a while to make sure you reel down before you even take that rod out of the rod holder. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. I never realized just until you mentioned that at six inches of rod movement is how much slack in the line about three feet of slack three feet of slack and we all know that slacks no no good so we're going to definitely keep that in mind see i learned something already i thank you dave <laughs> <laughs> um not to get too off off subject um but i'll tell you have you seen um, you haven't seen my podcast have you we're always off subject <laughs> <laughs> well I, I'll, I try to follow your lead but um uh, when we hit a good a good topic then uh, I'll give you a little extra on there. Okay. All right. We'll take it. So uh, what makes my, my guiding different than all the other guides that are out there is it's a one-on-one -on -one class. If you choose, I take people out who just say, I want to go enjoy a day on the boat, catch some fish and, and go home and never own a rod or reel or whatever. But that's not the majority of my people. Um, what my people, what the people that, that, come to me are looking for is a one-on-one -on -one class on how to, how to be successful at trolling and drifting. And that's just like not even the tip of the iceberg. That's the, the tip of the iceberg a thousand yards away, you know, through a pair of binoculars. Yeah, that's a really general way of putting it. There's so much involved in any of that. But I go into the whole, um, every single detail. Really, fishing can be as as simple as a broken clocks, and I use this term all the time, a broken clocks right twice a day, and you can have success and not know what you're doing um, by a lock, or it can be as scientific and as detailed as you make it to be. And that's where, that's where I come in, um, because I do everything as a perfectionist. And I research everything out, and I put it to use. Um, but it's there's so many fine details um, that will make you a better angler if you 
just know that there's a there's so many fine details out there and you're a sponge and soak it up and, and pay attention to what we're, we're going to go over in those five hours because mm -hmm. it does make a massive difference and a lot of times it's really as simple as just how somebody sets that hook by reeling down that that can be a uh, it's a hundred percent deal breaker you know if you don't have the right hand position on there and you don't have the right speed i always tell people it's like mall walking it's not a walk and it's not a run but it's quick with a purpose and if you go to that reel a thousand miles an hour and you start reeling down that rod tip's just going to bounce like crazy and you're you're losing everything that you're trying to accomplish if you go too slow you're going to miss that fish too and sometimes the fish hooks himself and again you know luck happens but um there's a whole science to it, and that's really what what sets me apart. Is I will sit down and, and go over all those details and to any level that you want to go to, and I enjoy that that aspect of it. All right, so Dave, why channel cats? What what led you to channel cats? They're pretty abundant in our area, um, and they put up a great fight. You know, it's in central Iowa, so we're limited on the uh, the amount of fish that are larger to catch, everything's in perspective to everybody. You know, people who go out and they fish ultralight equipment for 14 inch crappies, those are big fish to those people in their perspective. Mm -hmm. But in my perspective, a big fish is, is literally that. It's a big fish that takes two hands to hold up. And that when you're done reeling that fish and you go, my arm's a little tired from, you know, holding that rod or, or netting, you know, netting big fish all day. Uh, and that's really what I like. The, and it's the fight. I have like a tagline that I use too that says, once you see the, the, the takedown, you'll be hooked. There's nothing in the world that's, that's quite as exciting um, as watching a seven foot six rod go from nothing to bend over in the, in the, the time it takes to blink your eye, you know. I, I couldn't. Still, agree. I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I always tell people it's like magic. It's like you're looking at this water forever, but a long time you're out there, and what do you see? You see water, and then all of a sudden it produces something, and that something's usually pretty darn cool if you ask me it's almost magic to me i get that feeling every time i hook into a fish or i see that rod get buried down so i totally get it i really do and the majority of people will ask well you know like i said early on what's the biggest fish you caught or you know how many fish did you catch this year i don't know that i've caught maybe 12 to 15 fish myself this year because i just don't have the time to fish myself um <clears throat> but what keeps it exciting is not just teaching the people, but every day I get to go out and watch that that takedown. Or just put them on the fish. That's pretty cool. That makes me happy. If I can, and I'm not saying that I'm making them catch fish, but I can put them over a fish or in the area where they can do their thing. That 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 really does bring. And I, it, this might sound tacky. It brings me joy to see it happen. Yeah, I've done well, a, I, I've, I've done a few live streams where I've brought people that have never dragged baits, at least never dragged baits for channel cats, and I put them on 14, 17, 20 fish, and they're just amazed. They had no idea that those kind of fit or those numbers exist where we're at. You know, and it kind of made me feel not just proud of the, you know, like, hey, I did that, but it was to, to see how happy it makes people. It really does. Yeah, so I, I get it. couldn't agree more. So how did it, how did uh, it all come together, your, your guiding? Um, you know, we talked initially about. Matt, uh, right. Right. And, and getting kind of the, the, um, oh, the, the extra push, I guess, is, is the best way to put it. But I, I always, I hate to say this, but I'm going to go back to what I was saying earlier. Okay. Um, about trying to be as, as close to a perfectionist as I can and like a hundred percent on everything that I do. Um, what I had, what I had done in the years past was I'd taken a year and I said, okay, I'm going to study bluegills. I'm going to study largemouth bass. I'm going to study walleyes. I'm going to study yellow perch, <clears throat> whatever the species was. I took an entire year and I, over winter time, I didn't, I don't do a ton of ice fishing, but I did a ton of research. 
and the research, what I looked at, it wasn't um, 400 different YouTube videos with 400 different opinions. It was biologist research. And it was books that were written from the 60s and 70s and you know 80s when um, they didn't have the technology. They had to go off of this is what the biology of the fish is telling the you. The actual data. Exactly. And that was the kind of research that I that I did. So when it came to channel cats, um, I really just researched out as much as I possibly could and then try to put it all to use. And it worked, but then when I saw how effective um, trolling, drifting, whatever, I always troll. I, I've used drift socks twice this year. I hate using drift socks. Me too. <laughs> so I'll just refer from here on out as trolling for catfish. Okay. When I saw how um, effective that was, it was just lights out. That's all I. I that's all I've got to do. It's just been nothing. You you can't life. anchor up over three miles of water in a day. You just can't do it. It's not possible. But you can troll over three miles of water in a day pretty easily. It's right. the way I've been looking at it. I don't know why I waited so long. I just started uh, dragging baits. I did it once last year, and then this year, that's the only way I pretty much fish, unless I'm targeting flatheads. Then you kind of don't have a chance. But I do catch flatheads while I'm dragging baits, too, though, surprisingly. Just not real big ones, but it happens. So right place, right time. I think we caught a 30 or a 31 um, with my other guide on his lake. It was a flathead, but... That's a good fish anywhere. I don't care what you say. That's I'm proud to catch a 30. I'm happy. That brings that smile to my face. So right. anyways, we're talking about something else here. So yeah, all right, I, I could talk to you about all of this stuff forever. Let's talk a little bit more about catfishing. What do you say? Yeah. All right. Let's 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 get into catfish basics. I have a lot of beginners that come in here and, and watch a lot of my content and stuff. So uh, uh, what would be um, a good place for, for them to start? Well, what I would do is I would... There's a lot of thoughts. I'm just trying to channel this into the, the, the most simplest. Um, one is I would talk to maybe like your local DNR officer and see if they have a fish biologist that you can you can call. A lot of times these guys don't get out and do a lot with the public. You know, they're kind of stuck behind data-driven surveys and different things like that. But if you can talk to the like a local local fish biologist that knows the waters and knows what your home fish are doing, um, start with there and say, hey, you know, I really like to get into catfishing. What, if you could give me five tips, what would they be? Take that information. Now, the other thing is, is equipment. Um, and I know this is gonna probably burn a lot of people, but it just, it is what it is. Guys are generally the more, uh, the larger population of, of catfish, catfish anglers. Cat, anglers, anglers, there we go. Okay, I want to try to be fair to everybody. But it's it's pri primarily more male male sport or more male species. So guys always have this mindset, bigger is better. You know, I got to have a six inch lift on my truck and great big mud tires, but it'll never touch a gravel road. It'll never touch a cornfield. But I can go to the store, I'll be darn, and, you know, get my milk and bread. Um, but they always have to think bigger is better. And you totally see this transfer over into catfishing. You know, these, these guys that are using gigantic surf rods and just these, these um, broom handle rods and the biggest winch reel that they can possibly find and, you know, 110-pound line and all this other stuff and, you know, small bot hooks or whatever you get the idea i do i and i can attest that you know catching like a even a 10 pound channel can on 65 pound test with a heavy rod is no fun it makes yeah. it kind of too easy i always put it akin to you know lift, lifting a bicycle with a winch and that's not what it's all a part of and i mean it is sure. what it is so i absolutely get what you're saying sure so when you're you know when you when you're going to talk to your biologist you're going to realize what type of fish are in your area you know is is the average channel cat 10 to 20 pounds? Is it five to 10 pounds? And anything over 10 is considered a trophy fish for you. And then you wanna buy gear that's appropriate to the size of fish that you're, you're catching um, or the style of, of waters that you're gonna be fishing. 
if you are fishing in a gigantic river with a huge current um, and a lot of snags, you're going to need a little heavier equipment. Absolutely. Even just to get the baits out to where you need them sometimes. Sure. So I would say start there um, and buy equipment that's appropriate for the fish that you're going after. It's not bigger is not better. Bigger is actually much worse. And I spent my morning this morning doing a basically a rod seminar um, explaining how actions of rods work and how angles I mean, again, it goes into as scientific as you want it to, mm -hmm. how the angle of the rod and the angle of the line plays a huge part in making that a successful, um, making that a successful uh, landing of the fish, I guess, is what I'm, what I'm looking you're, you're at. You're preaching to the choir here. We can talk about that later, though, but keep going. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, um, especially, especially with channel cats and circle hooks. Because you have to keep in mind that, you know, in, a, in theory, you're pulling that hook out of the fish's mouth on, its, on the way out. You're reeling that in, and that edge of that hook is, is turning and, and biting into not bone like bass fishing, where you can rip that, that hook set, and you can just burn that fish across the water, you know, getting it in. Most of the time, you're getting it right in the corner of their mouth, and that's just like the same um, structure that we have, bone, bone, and then skin and it's soft skin and so you can get that hook if you're lucky you know deep in there you got a good inch of, inch of skin to go through um, or you can nick the edge of that 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 lip or the edge of their mouth and that's what knowing what you're doing and knowing the science of like how to bite a fish and how to reel down will get you that that extra five fish a day or five fish a week or whatever it is. Um, and I, I, I always point that out too, because I guarantee you that on every trip I take, we at least see two or three where it's just barely, I mean, it's hooked by a hangnail. Whisker hooks, right? Yeah. And yep. so I always point it out. I'm like, this is exactly why I said, don't do this or don't do that. because Or, or, don't, it, or don't go with too heavy a gear. Absolutely. Because you, you, you lose that. You lose that um, communication between you and the fish. I don't know how else to put it. It's not telegraphing exactly what it's happening. So, yeah, I, yeah I'm, built, right. I'm guilty of that sometimes too myself. So, yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, I tried to stay on topic, but I, I think the initial question was, what would you tell a person getting into? Yeah, here we go. And we're already fish. getting. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the two biggest things is I would talk to somebody who knows what they're doing in, in your local area. And then I would I would buy equipment that's appropriate for what you're trying to do. Now, and tell me if you agree with this. What I usually tell somebody who comes to me like, hey, I want to get into catfishing. First thing I'll say is what kind of gear do you have already? Because they're usually people who have fished already. And if they say have they have one of those, you know, the ugly stick rods that everybody and their mother has, I'd be like, you know what? Use what you have. See if you like it. If, you, if they get worst kind of scenario, my thinking is if they get hooked into a big one and they lose it, they're going to want to go up back after that fish. They're going to be hooked even more. Then we can worry about some other stuff. So I always tell people, use what you have until you figure out exactly what, what you want to do and where you want to go with the sport. Yeah, that's true. I think the other side of that, and not to be like um, the glass is half empty, but that can discourage people. You think so? You know, I'll have to stop I, doing that then. I, I think like if you, I'm not saying that like ugly stick is a discouragement. Mm -hmm. They make a great rod. But I'm just, if somebody was given a hand-me-down 12-foot surf rod that has no action and no backbone and it's just a piece of steel out there. Right. You're going to end up losing more fish probably than you're going to catch. And the ones Absolutely. you catch, it's not going to be as exciting as it could be. So... Kind of, I hate to say, you know, spend a little bit of the money and look at what sporting goods are. Everything sporting goods is super expensive. My yeah. old neighbor spent, told me he spent like a grand on a driver. I don't even know how to tell the difference between a thousand dollar driver and a Wilson hundred dollar mm -hmm. golf set from Walmart. But there's a difference, right? I'm, assur I'm sure there is. And there's a difference in the way it performs and the consistency in the way it performs and how that fits you and it fits your style of whatever. I don't, I'm not a golfer. I'm, not, I'm just using that as an example. But it's probably more enjoyable to go out with something that is more 
that fits you or, mm-hmm. you know, fits your style than it is to just go, hey, you know, this is grandpa's golf clubs and we'll go out. And he was six one, but I'm five six and I can't figure out why I missed the ball more than I hit the ball or, you know, whatever the case is. I don't know. I think that. Oh, I get it. Trust spend... You're talking to a guy who buys $200 Shimano reels to crappie fish. Sure. So I get it. It's that, that, but I, I kind of, well, I kind of consider it, you know, uh, uh, enjoying the process more than actually getting the job done. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, which is why I will pull out. I have no problem buying a graphite rod, you know, or an S glass rod or something that costs a little more. Um, I'm, I'm totally for that. Trust me. I got a garage full of way high end stuff that, that, that I really adore and like, um, but yeah, I get what you're saying too. If they got grandpa's right out there, which is kind of why you ask and find out what they have is, is what I kind of sure. go from there or, or I'll go with them. I'll let them use my stuff. And usually I have a friend that resulted in like a $500 purchase that his wife wasn't really happy with me all said and done once they got the bill. So I'm sure I've, a lot of wives off over the last five years <laughs> he ended up with he's like well what's the rod limit and the rod limit here is like three it's it's two but if you're dragon baits it's three um so he bought three whisker seeker rods three abus without even telling me he just looked at what i had and he's like boom pull the trigger yeah i got a I, you know she used to invite me over for dinner she doesn't so much anymore i'm not even a kid about that so, so rachel if you're listening out there i'm sorry she watches my stuff every now and then so She'll get a kick that away bounce. So yeah, let's okay. Well, let's let's talk next level then. All right. So let's okay. say you you got the catfish bug and and you want to get into the high higher dollar gear or or more advanced tactics. Where do we go from here? Um. Well, I would I always go to two things: boat fishing or bank fishing. Um. They're they're two different things because if you're generally bank fishing, you know you're going to have to kind of get your line out there a little bit more than. Mm-hmm than average, which means you're going to use a little heavier weight or you're fishing in a current or, um, you know, the list, the checklist is, is 25 deep, but it's different style of fishing. So that's one avenue. Um, and then the other is going to be if you're, if you're trolling or if you're, you know, anchored goes pretty much into the same thing as, as bank fishing. But it really depends on how much a person will listen to, to what I would have to say as to how much science is behind what makes a good rod or what makes a bad rod. And like you were saying with your crappie reels that are $200, my walleye jigging rods are $400 rods. Yeah. And I can feel every grain of sand that's down there. And I can feel every single leaf if I'm in the weeds, you know, jigging for perch Mm -hmm. um, versus a tiny little perch bite, you know, that's in there or was at the edge of a leaf. Um, But it's designed for, for what I'm trying to do. And I spent two hours this morning going over just what makes fishing rods fishing rods. So I have about 15, maybe 20 minutes um, of time to, to kind of keep it on schedule. So I would, I would basically just say that you need to talk to somebody, call the rod companies. If, and I'm not, I'm not a, this is the only rod that's out there, but if you call, um, if you and I'm a, I hate to plug it. If you call Whisker Seeker and you say this is my style of fishing, you're going to talk to a person that's fished that style, or you're going to talk to a person who um, says, "Hey, I I don't fish that style, but the guy next to me, you know, does or, or whatever," and you're going to get you exactly what you need. Is it a nine foot six rod? Well, if you have a Toyota Corolla, you don't want it really necessarily a nine foot six rod, or if you don't like taking rods into two pieces. All, there's a million things to consider, but I, I would say I would look at, at two things. I would look at the service of the company and what the reputation is. Um, you can't build a bad product and have a good reputation. Those two things are oil and water and they don't go together. And then I would look at um, the action and the weight of the rod. Today I took five different rods that were seven foot six rods, medium heavies, fast action and moderate action. And I took it was three heavy rods that were seven foot six and we compared the differences. The one thing that the people don't understand is there's no industry standard on what makes a fast action or a medium heavy rod. And those rods that we looked at today were completely, um, 
from one end of the, of the spectrum to the to other. other. So you go into a place like, um, you know, like, oh, I like shields. I don't fish for them. I just like it because they take their employees and they take them to like a fishing camp for the week. And they're fishing with um, the reps from these companies and they're giving them next level details. So when you go in and you get, you say, this is what I want to do, they're going to get you into the equipment that's best for, suited for you on that. Um, again, I mean, I could, I could talk for two hours and I've already done it once today on just rods, <laughs> but you just have to buy equipment that, that is the right fit for you. Go back to the golf club. Makes button. sense. Total don't, sense. Don't just, you know, expect a, a garage sale golf club to get one like a pro tuned one from a, now, now, how important are reels to the whole setup? So, uh, catfishing is um, extremely violent, if you want to call it that, versus a lot of other fishing. You know, um, it's like the MMA of fishing, right? <laughs> kind of is, yeah. Your your equipment takes a massive beating. Um, I use the Abu Garcia, the sixty five hundred C threes. I've used them since they came out in the, with the orange ones and we boated somewhere over 5,500 to 6,000 fish on them and I've never serviced them and they're on the water four to five days a week they're bouncing down the road um, I do take like Don just soap and a toothbrush at the end of the year and I just scrub off the nasty and maybe a little drop of oil here or there but um, that's it it's this year it. I will I will take them in to have all the parts you know kind of redone or, or, mm -hmm. and worked over just because I, i'd rather I, do it over winter than yeah i'm guilty of doing mine in the winter out of boredom to be honest with you they really don't need them i pull them apart and go well this is in pretty good shape also you know you know you've got a good reel if everybody's trying to replace you you know what sure. i mean there's right that's that's the way i look at it we got a lot of people that want to try a lot of different reels and stuff but i i couldn't recommend them uh, granted they're a little more money but w once you learn how to service them and you can get into that used market you do pretty well all of mine are used i rebuild them myself and and i haven't been happier since you know after talking to keith robbins from uh, um uh, fishing stuff uh, we came to the conclusion that the the abu 6500 is pretty much the 1911 of fishing reels you could they'll always be here they've always been there and you can always find parts for them so that that's but, all in my book so that's good enough uh, in my book i should say sure i do want to touch on on one thing with that though uh, i hate to sound like a broken record and i'm really stuck on it this this uh this recent time frame is the real has to be able to, to withstand what you're going to put it through. But if you don't have, again, the right hook, the right line, and know how to work a rod and let the fish bite the rod, not the reel, Yep. it doesn't matter. You know, I nope. um, it, ju it just doesn't matter. There's an entire science behind fighting fish. It's, it, it, it's, it's strictly on angles. I love it. I, I, cause you can go into like the the ninth layer of oh my god i had no idea that this is actually like how it all works people just oh the rod's been an over reel it down and then you know bring the fish in and, and let that, me take a let me take a real quick break for everybody that's watching here uh we are going to have an ask me anything with dave uh so stay tuned for that uh when we do that you guys are going to be able to hammer them i'm sorry david but they're going to hammer you with as technical questions as you want to so uh if you really want to get into next level stuff make sure you you're subscribed and you have that bell notification rung and uh, as soon as it comes out I'll, I'll make sure to uh uh advertise it on the um on my social media and on my community tab so stay tuned to that that's something i'm really looking forward to just from our few minutes talking already david all right so i i, I agree with you on the real it's all it's a lot of it's in the in the line you use and and obviously even more the 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 rod you use so uh, uh let, let, let let's go let's get a little bit into um the actual chase um when you're going on the okay um, when, when you're heading out to fish for the day, whether, you know, if it's with a client or, or not, to, you know, f let's forget about what their goals are. What, how, how do you go about that? How do you, how, where do you start to have a successful day of fishing? Well, everything is, I learned this. Um, and again, it's, it's a story I repeat and I'm sorry, you probably heard it three times and, and whoever else has heard me talk. 
has heard it at least a dozen times. Um, it's all perspective. And I just, I just emphasize how much it's in that person's perspective. So my perspective is 100% perfection, 100% of the time. But some people's perspective is is completely different than that. So you have to blend that together with what your goals and what your you know what your drive is, so that it's successful for them and you meet their what their perspective uh, goal for that trip was. Um, it goes back to man, I, I felt bad about this one. And like I said, we've caught thousands of fish. And I can remember a, a handful of them that stick with me. And this is the one where it was like the aha moment. Um, and again, sorry if you guys have heard this before, but I took a lady out fishing. And we had just a, a, a fiddler fish on there, you know, spotted little little channel cat. And my mindset was, how many fish can we get in the boat? Like a, like every every um, every trip was like its own tournament. I've got five hours with you. I've got to land as many fish as possible. And that was a successful trip. Um, so when we get this, I don't know, maybe like 14 inch channel cat on there and got, you know, shook the bait off. And so we bring it in, net it. I always net every fish because I'll get into that, you know, some other time. I've had a million hooks in my, in my fingers and people you take out you, that don't know, you know, safety of hooks and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just net every fish. Um, so I net it, I pop the hook out and I throw it right over the side of the boat. And in my head, I'm thinking, shit, man, I got to cut bait. Now I got to cast that back out or, you know, get it on a board or, you know, change everything up. And it was just a, a waste of time pounding a half 14 inch, you know, 14 inch fish. So I threw that fish over the side of the boat and this lady like jaw drops. What, are, what did you do? I can't believe you did that. And I'm like, well, I can't believe we're having this conversation. You know, you don't realize the quality of fish that are in this lake. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I don't understand why that was a bother. You know, what, what's going on here? That was the biggest fish that uh, I've ever caught in my life. I wanted a picture with it. So, you know, if you're not always learning, um, then you should be. Let's just put it that way. And I learned immediately what perspective was and what made a a successful trip to everybody is whatever it is for that person. And now that's why I always say before we go, I want to know what your expectations are. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that I can't meet, I would rather you not book a trip with me and, and me knowing that you're not going to walk away 100% satisfied. Yeah, absolutely. I'm pretty sure that the people watching this are looking to catch more and bigger fish. What would be some tips for them to do that? Uh, more and bigger fish. Um, well, you're good. You're going to catch more fish if you understand how the entire system works. Okay. So again, go back to the guy that I had taken out who said, I see you catch more fish than I do. Well, it wasn't the fact that he was fishing wrong like we were talking about. It was, his presentation was good. His equipment was good. But it was mm -hmm. how he was setting the hook and fighting the fish. And it was it was from the rods loaded to the fish and then getting a fish to the net. That's where his failure was. And I say failure in the sense that that's where, that's where he was losing his fish. Um, so... More fish is going to be understanding it, the science of how it all works. You know, the angles okay. of the line, the angles of the rod, which is the right style rod, equipment, blah, 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 that we've, you know, kind of talked about. And then the, the bigger fish is really understanding the biology. Why do the fish want to be here when the water temperature is this? If I only have so much structure in a lake, the structure can be anything that's different from, from foot to foot. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. It can be um, a four foot, I call it a hill or a four foot mound underwater, or it can be a four foot valley. But that change in normal, normalcy is considered structure. So the lake that I fish the majority of the time, it's a reservoir. It used to have great brush piles and it used to have good uh, river channel ledges to it. But with the Three years ago and four years ago, we had 200-year floods, and we lost 90%, 99% of those brush piles. 
and so much salt has gone in that there's only a seven foot now that's it's six to seven foot drop from the the flats to the channel but literally that's the only thing in that in that lake that's that's there is it's the hills and valleys and it's the channel and there's no other structure in that in that lake so you have to understand what you're going after and i spend every winter reading the same books that we you know like we were talking about mm -hmm. going over that same information because if i forget or or uh, go you know i totally space that off this year um, i want to try to keep that fresh but i always want to be learning and i think that's what's going to get you bigger fish is understanding the biology of them and more fish is understanding how to you can get them to bite but you you know you've got to be able to get them to the boat and that's, uh, I, unless you come on the water, like, and, and I mean that, Mark, to you specifically. Okay. Um, if you come on the water with me, you're going to understand exactly what I'm talking about behind the science of it. Um, it's not going to be like, okay, now I want you to, to reel a little bit faster, or reel a little bit slower, or put your rod up, or, you know, your rod down. It's going to be explaining how this all works as a system together. And... You know, I will tell you, like, hey, no, you dropped your rod too much, you know, or whatever the case is, or I'll go over there and hold a rod up or, or whatever. No, you need to be at this angle. And it, you can take it to that, you know, the next level, and you're going to see that all those little fish that are, are caught in that whisker, you can still land them. Mm -hmm. And that's going to get you more fish. So that's, that's the long answer to your question of bigger fish and, and more fish is really understanding how the whole system comes together, biology and equipment and how to use it properly. Cool. Um, can you give us any resources besides like the DNR for uh, the biology lessons? Are there any books that come to mind that you would recommend? Yeah, you know, I was gonna dig out the books that I read each year, um, but my my wife is uh, big into the animal rescue stuff. And right now mm -hmm. there's a mound of like dog rescue stuff in front of it all. <laughs> And I just didn't get the time to dig them out, but um, there's some older books. And actually what I found was the best way to, to find these books is going to like your used bookstore and okay. go like under, under fishing. And if, I found great walleye books. I found great uh, catfishing books. And like I said before, those are the people that used things um, like just understanding structure. You know, it wasn't electronics. It wasn't, it wasn't. Uh, the the fanciest glitteriest jig on the market you know it was just understanding why the fish want to be there and and when they want to be there a, a lot of the stuff that i come across in some of these older books and and and, and you learn it quickly that these people learned all this through r trial and error and they were able to repeat the results that's usually what I what I tell people that are just getting started. And like, you know what? Try whatever you think. Go 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 get yourself whatever book on how to fish for X X fish. Look at and, and and learn what the textbook stuff is. Try it on your body of water, and if you can repeat those results consistently, chances are they're, they're it's good advice. You know, but a lot of times, whether it's YouTube or books or whatever, it doesn't pertain to every single body of water out there, except obviously, except for like the biology stuff, you know, after talking to a couple of people, I've definitely come to the conclusion that fish like to be comfortable and they like to eat, right? And they like to be mm -hmm. safe. Those are the three things I kind of look at in my textbook search. So I call it my, all the textbook spots when I'm looking for fish. Anytime I, I, I get out on the water, I look, try to figure out where those spots are at first in accordance with time of the year and stuff and if those don't start working i'm usually at a loss every now and then i'll get lucky i'll find another spot to add to that list but usually there's that reason that they're there and that's because there's either food there or the temperature is a little different or they just feel safe there's some structure that i missed the waters that i fish here is so barren when it comes to structure and a drop the, the actual river channels literally maybe a one foot drop usually that's mm -hmm. about it the average average depth here on the fox is between four and five feet that's how shallow that river is but it still produces some pretty big fish it's just finding them in a water that's that busy being right outside of chicago and that traveled by i mean we that that, that little river ours has like 30 foot 40 foot bajas going up and down it all weekend long 
which makes for tough fishing on the weekends, which is why I keep off of it. But you can only imagine what, you know, 40 years of that is done to the bottom of that river. It's sure. done quite a bit. But yeah, that's when, when I, I mentioned textbook tactics a lot to people when I'm talking, and that's exactly what I mean. Um, figure out your body of water, whether it's, you know, food, comfort, you know, temperature, safety, right? Structure, obviously. I, I did a lot of talking with Ted Ellenbeck about that. He's a big, big, big structure and the whole, you know, um, biology of that. I have his uh, DVD actually right here. In there the you stack go. Of, of DVD. Let me get it in the, in the frame. And it's... Uh, any fish, any water, and Ted is is is. Um, I mean, the, the guy is like a, a genius, but you know, he gets his information from. Um, he gets his information from surveys from biologists. It's not yep. head, head's opinion, and that's really why I try to follow that information too. And the, you know, I got the other video of his. I did. I, I had no idea you were even going to mention his name. Uh -huh. But this is on my table in my in my uh, in my TV room, my room downstairs. You know, not like my wife gets to look at this all the time. But these are the ones that are on my on my table. Shallow water channel cats. Ted's a great guy. He's a real nice guy, and he absolutely knows what he's talking about. He's uh, in the process of turning his daughter, if I'm not mistaken, into a master angler. She's been doing pretty good chasing uh, pike, if I'm not mistaken, at least the last couple of times I've been talking to him. And and I think she's got a heck of a mentor. If you if you have a chance to catch any uh, uh, seminars by Ted or even go out and check out his DVDs and stuff, he's got a lot of stuff online as well. He's even did some stuff on Catfish Weekly. He's done his seminar on there, which was pretty cool. That's the first time I was exposed to him and i'm glad i was so yeah that's surprising that you have them i don't have those dvds i wonder if he sells them electronic copies my wife had me get rid of the dvd players because we don't play dvds anymore believe it or not yeah i i know that he's got it on a thumb drive you can get to well we got it for our uh our high school fishing team oh nice i got a bunch of them and, and we gave them out for that so i know you can get them digitally as well so I, do, I want i do want to point one thing out though too on on that is don't overthink things you know um, a fish, average channel cat, let's just say, has the brain the size of a pea. And that's in 5,000 acres of water that I fish. So it just goes off of what their instincts are telling them to do. And you have to understand, like, hey, when the water temperature is 85 degrees at 6 in the morning, where do the fish want to be comfortable? It's not like they're thinking out things going, Oh, you know, if I go here from 7 a.m. to this and that, you know, they don't think like we think. And no. You just have to understand the simple biology and what makes them, I hate to use the word tick, mm -hmm. but what makes them comfortable, what makes them want to be somewhere in a certain time or a certain climate or a certain uh, fish don't have eyelids, you know. They may not want to be in a foot of water on at 1 o'clock on a, on a sunny day when it's 90 degrees. You know where I catch them? I catch them when the shade, the shade goes, the mile-long bridge goes over the, the water in the shadows. Every There's not a cloud in the sky, and then a cloud comes over. I said, watch, within two minutes of this cloud, we're going to catch fish, and we always do. Uh, it's just... That's good when you can do that, can't you? I love taking my buddies out and saying, this spot's going to produce fish, and when we do, it really makes me look good. I love when that happens. I'm not going to lie. I, I, I totally <laughs> nailed it on my last trip. Uh, the year we actually caught our biggest channel cat and i told the guy i said everything tells me that this bend that we're going to go over is going to produce a fish and it's going to produce a good one i said look at the screen look at what everything we've been through we're talking about biology and structure i said this is like this is the pinnacle of everything we talked about i said if we don't have a fish on in the next 45 seconds i'll buy you lunch and i bet it wasn't 20 seconds later we caught the biggest fish of the year and Did you get free like, lunch? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I can't believe how you put that together. It's just, it was either pure luck or you knew exactly what you were talking about. And sometimes it's a little bit of both, but it just worked out perfect. Uh, so where can people find you online, Dave? How can they get in touch with you? We're going to put links, obviously, in the description here on YouTube and in the podcast. Um, uh, so make sure you check those out. But but why don't we just tell people that don't want to look at the description how they can get a hold of you, how they can hire you, out, and all of that good stuff. Right. So the two best ways um, are, you know, my website, which is the general information. Um, I kind of say, you know, that's the cover of the book. Uh, it's chasingcats.com. And you can put it in with a G or without a G. I have both the domains um, for that. Mm -hmm. Chasing cats or chasing cats. The actual name of the guide service is chasing cats without a G. Um, 
Um, I should have never just dropped the G, man. I should have just put it in there because people are like, I looked up chasing cats. And well, you got both finding. domains. I've done the same thing. Trust me. I know what you're doing. So, uh, but Facebook is going to be more of the real time information, but it's almost one of those things where it's kind of somewhat outdated. If you're going strictly on Facebook and when we're catching the most fish, you're not going to get in that year. And that's just being a hundred percent honest. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying like, oh, I'm so busy. I can't get you in. Usually by June, the rest of the year is 90% booked. Okay. So I would say if you want to keep up with what's going on in real time in central Iowa, Facebook is where it's at. If you want to understand more about how the system works and, and get kind of the, the cover or the back of the book that tells you what's inside, go to the website. Perfect. So at right. Facebook, it's, you know, chasing cats guides. Uh, you want to shout out any of your sponsors? So, yeah, you know, I do use Whisker Seeker uh, Tackle. That's 99% of the, the terminal tackle rods that we use, everything pretty much except for the reel. Um, I do always have a, a planer boards out, and so it's church tackles, what I've used. I've used a lot of different planer boards, and, and I love the fact that um, their boards are, are super easy for me to get in and get on, get off, and I don't chase boards down. They don't take a lot of storage up in my in – my, uh, in my boat and my smooth move seats. Man, when you spend a million hours on the water, um, it wrecks havoc on your back and having those air ride seats are, are definitely uh, a life. They're on, my, they're on my must have list for my next boat. So I get what you're saying there. Sure, you know, the list goes on, but you know, the other thing too is uh, I, I fish for Big Frig and it's a cooler company. But if you don't have, if you, you don't have cold water in the summertime and you don't have a you know, bimini top or, you know, or whatever to keep people comfortable, um, they're not going to be comfortable and, and they're not going to listen to what you're saying and, and whatnot. So those are kind of my big ones right there. And then, you know, fish bite rod holders, uh, you can't, you can't catch fish if you don't have a good rod holder, multi bar. Um, I don't, I'm not one of those guys who just like buy this, buy this, but those are the ones I fish for. A multi bars. I got my eyes on a set of those in the next boat too. Pretty cool. Sure. And those fish bite, right. you know, I don't have any fish bite rod holders, but I pretty much exclusively buy their, uh, uh, their bases. They're pretty much hands down the best and they're really reasonably priced too. So yeah, Owen's a good guy. Good stuff. Well, Dave, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you having me. It's always fun to talk. And I want to remind everybody that we are going to do an Ask Me Anything with David here soon, where you guys can grill him, but set the fire to his feet and, and get him to answer any of your questions. Are you down for that? I'm looking forward to it. I really, I can go into like the, the eighth level of stuff, you know, uh -huh. but I try not to go in there right off the bat. So if somebody wants to, I'll just go down that, that rabbit hole and we'll talk. So you, we got some pretty we got some pretty catfish crazy people that that watch the show including myself so i know that if me and you were talking we'd we'd probably spend a long time talking about some of the craziest stuff that it matters but does it well we can talk later so let me say good night to everybody thank you for watching thank you david i appreciate you. you have a good one keep your eye on the channel for the ask me anything with david weiner thank you